Uh, I had a fellow ask me a while back. Matter of fact, I was talking to someone about uh, eternity. And he said to me, he says, well, I just don't think there's any hope to, for me. I think I'm predestined to hell. That, that's, boy, that, that would be a miserable place to be, wouldn't it? To live your life just to think you're predestined to hell. So the title of the message is Predestined to Hell? Question mark. Now, I wanted to say hell no, exclamation point, but my wife said that was too strong. So I just put no, exclamation mark. Do you understand? And I'm not cussing. Do you understand? Predestined to hell? No. Absolutely, positively, without reservation, no, no, no. You have that? Now, let's look at what the Bible says. Isn't that the thing to do? To look what the Word of God says. Listen, all that you believe had better be predicated on the in eternal, infallible, preserved, God-breathed book called the Bible. Not your opinion or mine, but what thus saith the Lord. I don't claim to understand all I know about it, but what I do understand, i got to get from this book. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm talking about any subject. I'm talking about any doctrine. Uh, whatever, whatever it is, it's got to be based on the book. That's what separates real Christianity from this fake Christianity. You know, you hear about real news and fake news. Well, there's real Christianity and there's fake Christianity out there. It, it is. It's a truth. Now, let's look at what the Word says. In Romans chapter 9, in verse 1, the Scripture says, and we'll read three verses to you, I tell you the truth in Christ. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Rome. And he says, I tell you the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. Okay? Because he'd been accused of being a liar. Listen, if you stand for anything and if you speak up, you'll be called one too. You will. The devil will see to it. You know? And he says... I'm not lying, and my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, I can't sin and get by with it because I'm real. Because the Holy Spirit won't let me. He'll trouble me. He'll, man, I just, he just loves me. He'll crowd me. He'll get close to me. I mean, you know, I love it when he's blessing. Man, I love the presence of God. But, boy, I'm telling you, when the correcting hand of God comes in, Sometimes it's not real pleasant, you know. I mean, it'll steal your sleep, steal your appetite. I mean, it'll do a lot of things. And why is that? Because he loves us. He says that I have great sorrow and continuing grief in my heart, Paul's saying. And, he, and, he's, and he, he's specifically referring to Israel, but this covers everyone. He says, For I wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. He had such a desire. He had such a... He says, Listen, our greatest mission in life is the salvation of lost folk. I mean, that's, that's priority one. What good does it... You know, I, listen, I believe in healing. I believe in miracles. I believe God can do. I mean, God of the Bible is the God I serve today. But what good does it do for you to get healed of cancer and still go to hell? You know? I mean, you know, our top priority, say top priority, is the salvation of souls. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. In this, in this peaches and cream, sugar and spice, everything's nice Christianity that's out there. I feel good, you feel good, kissy, kissy. You know, heaven, 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 heaven. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. Oh, you're so, oh, it's okay. You're okay, I'm okay. Listen, if you don't get lost people saved, 
They might be good people. They might be fun people. They might be friendly people. They might just be hardworking people. They might be honest people. But good, honest, hardworking, nice people go to hell without getting saved. I'm telling you. And so, and so Paul, Paul's heart was evangelism. And, and, and he had a burden for Israel. He had a sincere concern for souls. And I'm telling you, in, I, I don't want you to think just because a conservative won the White House that the battle is over. It is not over. It's just begun. It has just begun. And your prayer life needs to be as fervent and your, your love for the Lord needs to be rekindled to realize just because we have someone in the White House as our president and as our vice president that is friendly toward biblical Christianity after eight long dark years, it doesn't mean the devil's going to lie down and quit because he's not. He absolutely isn't. Paul had a concern for souls. And he had a steadfast concern for souls. Go back to verse 2. He, he says, uh, For I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. You see, if you don't see the lostness of the lost, it's not going to bother you. You'll just live any old way you want to live. You know, I don't care who sees me do what. I know who I am, and they can like it or lump it. Well, now, let me tell you something. I'm free to do a lot of things that I don't do because I don't want to be a stumbling block for those who might not understand. And that's not legalism. That's limiting my liberty for the good of, of, the, of the calls, for the good of the call of God, for the, the getting the gospel out to see lost people saved. Do you hear what I'm saying? I read a study a while back. You know, it ain't no wonder I'm going blind. I need to quit reading so much. I'm not going blind, by the way. And this study was studying um, Native Americans over the last 100 to 200 years, especially those in this area. And this and and this this work, this 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 piece, um, you know. Uh, do you know where we got smoking from? Indians. It was growing here. Do you understand? But they didn't do something that we do did used to. Some still do. They would smoke a pipe. On, no, it wasn't a peace pipe, but it's okay. It was a pipe. Smoke pipe. Oh, if you broke, dropped it, it might go in pieces. I don't know. But they would smoke a pipe, a bowl, a bowl of tobacco, and they would share it. And it was on special occasions. You know, do you understand? Uh, it, it might happen. It could happen once a week or twice a week. But it wasn't an everyday, and it wasn't a chain situation. You know what they found out? Now, I'm not advocating tobacco use because we've got it so doctored up. You know, we've got it so zing, zang, swooshy, you know, that, uh, you know, I mean, they've, they've, they've souped up the nicotine to where it's just like cocaine, you know, one or two, and it can have you. Just one or two, and it can addict you. But it wasn't like that in its natural state the way God created it. And there were beneficial things to it. Isn't that amazing? What God puts together is a good thing. And we try to improve on God, and look what happens. Do you hear what I'm saying? Paul had a great sorrow and continual grief did that mean, does that mean that he went around depressed and melancholy? and, and out? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that he saw the world as our God sees the world. And it's a lost world. 
Now you think about this. You, you know, if you are gainfully employed, realize that most likely the majority of the people that you see at work don't know Jesus. The majority of the people you see at school, they do not know Jesus. The majority of the people you see at Martin's or Walmart or the mall do not know Jesus. And Paul had a genuine concern, a steadfast concern. And not only that, but verse 3 tells us he had a sacrificial concern. Now, you see, that's where the American church, the modern church, the, the late 20th century, early 21st century church, for the most part, we let the boat leave the dock without us getting on. We, we're all for Jesus as long as it doesn't have any sacrifice attached to it. Because it's, I, we're in this, I feel, oh, I want to feel good. Oh, I want to feel good. And you know what? Sacrifice sometimes doesn't feel good. Sometimes it doesn't. After a while, it will. But that first sacrifice, you know, that first sacrifice. And you think, oh, my goodness. And you, 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 and you make it, whatever it is, time, talent, or treasure. You fill in the blank. And you think, oh, man. And then I guarantee you, soon something will come up. You, you know, I, I knew a fellow one time. He, uh, he felt impressed to give. He, he, he bought a new washer and dryer for his wife. They went out and bought a new washer and dryer. And they, the one they had was still working, you know. But, you know, you know how it is, guys. You know, they're outdated or they, they don't, the wrong color or whatever. I don't know. I don't understand all that stuff. I just know happy wife, happy life. You know? And so, and so, and they find somebody, and uh, one person took the washer, and one person took the dryer, and they get it plugged in, and a week later, the dryer dies. And, of course, the first thing you think is, well, I wish I had that old that old Sears, Sears Kenmore that we gave away. You know, ouch, inconvenience. Can I tell you God's in it all? Because look here. You see, God is the God of sovereign choices. Uh-huh. Now, now, now follow me. Verse 3 says, For I wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, verse 4, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption the, of glo the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, and it, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. I want you to know that the Jews are God's chosen people. I don't care if you like it or not, it's the truth. The Jews are God's chosen people. That was a ch sovereign choice of Almighty God. I mean, you know, he picked, he picked this group of people. He picked them. He, matter of fact, the Scripture says that uh, uh, we see, and he delineates the special privileges of the Jews. He called them Israelites. You see, they have a special adoption. Israel, Israel, prince of, with God, a prince of God. You see, God spoke of Israel as a son. They had the Shekinah glory of God. My goodness, can you imagine? Can you imagine what, what, what Moses looked like when he come down off the mountain? That he was, I mean, he, wa he was plugged into heaven's eternal batteries. And he was glowing brighter than neon. Matter of fact, he had such a glow, they, they had to cover him up. Because it was kind of unsettling and spooking the people. Man, he's been with God. Look at that. Look, ooh. Man, the Shekinah glory of God. Won't it be wonderful when we get in his presence? Oh, it's good when he comes down and he graces us with just a little, just a little thimble full. 
<laughs> and we can't hardly take that. Wait till the heavens break up and, and we see him as he is. Man, his eyes are just like a flame of fire, shining brighter than the sun. Oh, hallelujah, what a, what a Savior. He says, you see, and they had the covenants. God gave him the, the word of God. The, the, the Mosaic law, the Old Testament uh, was given to us through the Jew. I might add that the New Testament was too. There's two books in question, might be Gentile, Luke and Acts, and there's a debate over whether he was Jewish or a Gentile. I don't give, I don't really, it doesn't matter. It's God's word. And that, and the overwhelming majority, if not all of it, came through the Jew to me and you. And I'm glad of that. And then we see that, that and, and the Jews, they had special covenants. I want you to understand what the difference between a covenant and a contract is. I, and you need to listen to this, especially if you're not married. A covenant is not a contract. And, and do not enter into a marriage like a contract because it is not a contract. A contract's between two people. And the purpose of the contract is to protect one against the other. To my advantage. Well, let's enter into this contract. You see, and I'm going to protect my interests, not yours. A covenant means literally out of the Hebrew to cut. That's what a contract is, to cut, sacrifice. You're putting something in it, and a covenant is I'm in it for your best. You see, that's why when you stand before the preacher, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. You see, it's a covenant. It is not a contract. It is a covenant that God cut. He cut Adam, took Eve out. Do you understand? She gave birth. A covenant. Blood was there. Do you understand me? There's a covenant. A covenant from God. And the covenant came through the Jew. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The covenant came from the Jew, and, 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 and they were given the service of God. The, the, the Levitical rituals were entrusted to them. The special people of God, the chosen people of God, the Jew. And they were given the promises. Matter of fact, they, they were given the Messiah. His name's Jesus. Hallelujah. Record numbers of Jews are coming to Jesus today. Whew. I tell you, it's getting exciting. I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, people say, watch, watch. I'm listening. Come on, trumpet sound. I'm telling you, it's, it's getting exciting and getting more exciting. And I want you to understand that, that in God's sovereign choices, he, he gave special privileges to the Jews and God's choices regarding the children of Abraham. Now, I want you to know something. The children of Abraham, not all the children of Abraham were singled out or chosen. Do you hear what I'm saying? You know, he had Ishmael and he had Isaac. Look what verse 7 says. Verse 7. Not nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your, your seed shall be called. Do you hear me? You see, that's why since, since the um, 7th century, 6, 622 A.D., somewhere in there, where this illiterate, ignorant, uneducated pedophile by the name of Mohammed started an evil ideology that hides under the cover of religion. And that's where it comes from. And it's over this right here because they said, no, not Isaac, Ishmael, because he was descended of Ishmael. And, and so we see here uh, that not all the children uh, of Isaac were chosen. It was God's sovereign choice he chose Isaac and not Ishmael. Look at verse 9. The scripture says, For this is the word of promise, and this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. 
Verse 10, he says, And not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. Now remember, she had two, Esau and Jacob. And God chose Jacob over Esau. Verse 11, for the children not yet uh, being born, nor having done any good or evil. It wasn't anything to do with them. It had nothing to do with the individual. It was God's decision. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, now don't, don't go, don't, don't t- tune down on me because I'm not going where some of you might think I'm going. I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm going to show you something you need to understand about something that I'm not going to tip my hand on. And so, so J, he, he, uh, verse 12 says, It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. Verse 13, As it is written, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated. Now, I want you to understand, in, it, it comes over in English, hated. That's unfortunate. And you go back to the Hebrew from whence it come, and, and, and it's clear. And I want you to understand, hate had a different meaning when that was written than what it does today. You see, hate refers to preferring one over another. Do you understand? Now, if you've been around me very long, you know I was raised country, and I'd soon have eggs every morning. Now, I love fried eggs. I hate scrambled eggs. Now, don't misunderstand me. In other words, I prefer it. I'll eat either one of them. (laughs) Especially if you've got any bacon grease or sausage with it. Do you hear what I'm saying? I prefer fried eggs over medium. You know, where the yolk will run and the white is done way God intended it. It's the way it'll be served in heaven, at the, at, I'm sure. He says, Jacob I have loved, I have preferred over Esau. It wasn't that he despised Esau and he wanted to just be so mean to him and, and, and cause him angst and, and hurt and all that. No, nothing could be further from the truth. God is a God of love and he loves us. And, and so, and so I, I want you to understand that, um, can you put up real quick Genesis 25, 23? I, uh, I forgot to give that to you, uh, probably because I just now, never mind. Genesis 25, 23. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, two peoples, you get that? Two peoples shall be separated from your body. Two peoples out of, out of Esau and Jacob. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Do you get that? I want you to know that in all these choices that God made, Abraham out of his family, Isaac instead of Esau, Jacob I meant uh, Isaac instead of Ishmael, Jacob instead of Esau. These are not individual choices. These are national choices. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, uh, let, let me just bring it this way. God said, I will have a people. Well, he made a decision. I, my son is going to have a bride. So he made a decision. He made a choice. And he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, he made a group decision, but it did not negate the personal responsibility for you and I. Do you hear what I'm saying? For someone to say, well, I can't get saved. I'm predestined to hell. That's a lie from the devil. That's a lie from the devil. And then I've heard people say, well, I'm predestined to heaven, so I'm just going to live it up. Let me tell you something, hon. You've got to meet Jesus, and you meet Jesus, things start changing. You just can't, you can't meet him and not be changed. 
because I'm telling you, he's a changer. Do you hear what I'm saying? So, so God's choice was national and not personal. And look, look at Romans 9 12, if, if you got that up there. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. You see, God's choice was based on service, not salvation. Do you see it? It's based on serving. Sam Vineyard fathered five sons. Sam Vineyard was a preacher. He was my daddy. He, him, him and, him and the, I don't want to flip you out, but him and Pete Vineyard, <laughs> that was my mother's nickname. Sylvia Vineyard, they had six children. Five of them were boys, and one of them was a girl. I don't know if she lost or won. I think she won. And she was the baby. We won't go into that, but that messed it up for me because I was the baby. <laughs> and so God had, he called Sam Vineyard to preach. What did Sam do? Nothing. God chose him for service. Do you, do you, do you see? Well, was he good? No, I can tell you some. <laughs> Got to watch doing your family tree. Oh, Lord of mercy. You, never mind. You, you know who Sam Vineyard was, my dad? He's made out of the same stuff you are. You know, I could idolize him and just think all good things about him. And I, I dwell on the good, you know. If God's forgotten it, why shouldn't I? The bad. Amen? I mean, those who are gone are gone. Nothing can change. Amen? What did what Sam do? I mean, he wasn't even the firstborn son. I mean, he was the thirdborn child of Aristotle and Lucy Noe Vineyard. Thirdborn child. Yeah. What did Sam do? Why didn't he call William, his older brother? Or, 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 or Donald or Dennis? Or Paul? Well, he did call Paul, <laughs> my, my dad's baby brother. And so why, why, why did he just call two out of five of them boys? Why, 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 why was that? It was God's sovereign decision to call into ministry. Do you hear what I'm saying? Why did he call me and not my four older brothers? I think he might have called one, but that's a whole other story. Why, why me? Why not, you know, my oldest brother David? I mean, he was, he, he was so blessed. In, he is so blessed in so many ways. I mean, he pitched Major League Baseball. Tremendous athlete. He held the state record in scoring in basketball for years. A natural born athlete. I mean, everything he did was just, I mean, he was just so strong and so just, you know, just why not him? Why, why not him? You know, and I can just go down the list of my other, you know, why not? Why, why me? Oh, it was God's. Sovereign choice. I'm not any better than my other brothers. Do you hear what I'm saying? God chose sovereignly for service. People say, well, how do I know if I'm called to do something? We'll try to do it and see how you enjoy it. You see, I could not not preach. I just couldn't. Because I am called to it. And I got to do it. I mean, I got to do it. I mean, that's why, I mean, I'm on the radio five days a week. And I'm here Sunday morning and Wednesday night. And, and I, I'm, I'm going to Cuba uh, with three other folk in, in March. And, and buddy, they're going to work me like a mine mule. Do you think, well, yeah, I'm, I'm so in shape. You know, I'm 35 years old and weigh 180 pounds. Man, I can handle it. Baloney. 
but I'm called to it. Do you understand? I'm called to it. Service, not salvation. National. He, national, not singular. S you see how, call, how the sovereignty of God works? I believe that he called America into existence for a special, unique purpose. Now, it doesn't make Americans any better than Canadians or Mexicans or Russians or Chinese. Do you understand what I'm saying? But God sovereignly raised up the United States of America that was predicated not based on getting gold, not based on getting fame or wealth, but the foundation was laid that we could come and worship the true and living God according to the dictates of our conscience as we read the Word of God. That makes us unique. That's why 85% to 90% of all the missionary work done around the world is funded by evangelical Christian churches in the United States of America. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? God sovereignly, was we any better than anybody else? No, God, God loves the Dutch. He loves the French. He loves the Italian. He loves the Angolan. He loves the Nigerian. He, he loves the, the Saudi and the, and, and the, and the uh, whatever the other people, the Jordanian. He loves them just as much as Americans. But God makes sovereign decisions about national entities, and that's his prerogative because he is God. And now, I'm trying to get through. Can you throw John 15, 16 up there real quick, Emily? You're doing such a great job. I tell you, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 16. And I know it's coming. I can just feel it coming around the bend. Hear, hear the whistle? Woo, woo. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatever you ask in the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He's called us. He's called us to a job, to a place of service. He's called us. Don't think for a minute. Don't, don't listen to the devil. Well, I missed it. I'm, I'm, I'm where God can't use me. No, no, that's not true. Well, I shouldn't have married her. I shouldn't have married him. Well, I shouldn't have took that job there. I shouldn't, I shouldn't. No, 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 no. God knows all that stuff. And he sees you right where you are now. And he wants to use you right where you are now. Don't believe the devil's lie that you're unusable and that you don't count. And, you know, and whatever lie, well, I'm not educated enough, or I'm a man, or I'm a woman, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I'm too this, I'm too that. That's a bunch of hogwash. He will use you right where you are. You didn't choose him, he chose you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Now, so it's God's choice. It, it was his preference. He wasn't, he, he wasn't trying to, to despite you. He was preferring you. Now, I want you to understand something about God's character. Verse, verse 14. Verse 14, uh, 914 of Romans. What shall we say then? Is there an unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Now, I'm, I'm gonna, I've made this statement before, but I'm going to make it again, and I hope it sh sh shocks you so much your shoelaces untie. God is not fair. That's socialism, godless socialism. That's not from heaven. That's a lie from hell. 
not predicated on the Word of God. God is not fair. Now, I'll tell you what God is. God is just. There's justice with God. He's just. And you see, the longer you realize how just God is, the more you're going to appreciate mercy. Because if we got what our just deserves, we all go to hell and burn forever. If grace and mercy didn't rush in. Grace, us getting what we don't deserve. Mercy, not getting what we do deserve. Do you understand? God is not fair. You want a fair? Go to Berryville or wherever it is. The Clark County Fair or the Warren County Fair or the Shenandoah County Fair or the Frederick County Fair. If you want fair, that's the only fair I know of. God is not fair. And you see, that's why the, 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 uh, the political left is, is corrupting the theological left. And they're all about equality. And they're all about, you know, fairness. And all about, can I tell you, there's never been fairness. And there never will be. There will only be justice. God is just. Well, that's not fair. I should have got the promotion. Well, you can do two things. Be a better employee or hit the door and find another job. If you stay there and you mildew and sour and get ugly, they'll show you the door. Oh, that's not fair. I know it isn't. But it's just moving right along. God's spotless character. He's not fair. He's just. Romans 9, 15 and 16, look what it says. It says, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, you know, you and me, but of God who shows mercy. You see, God is free to pardon and free to punish. Hallelujah for grace. Hallelujah. Listen, I don't deserve anything good from God, but boy, I've sure received a lot of good from God. Amen. I mean, my goodness, you look at, look at the blessings of God. Look at, look at your children, your grandchildren. Look at your, 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 your life, your health, whatever it is. that You know, my goodness, you say, oh, but, I, but it's not fair that I'm there. You know, Brother Gary could say, well, it wasn't fair I got hit and got knocked 100 feet down the road and got a knot on my head and, and a headache and bruised brain and all that. I could have told him about the bruised brain years ago, but... But, you know, I, I, why, that wasn't fair. Listen, God's got a plan. Look for God in the bruise. God has a plan. He's got a plan. Don't let the boat leave the dock. And you say, well, I didn't get that promotion. Or I, didn't, I wanted this, and I thought I was going to have this, and this situation was... Look for God. He's there, not your will, not your working and strife, but it's God who shows mercy. I'm telling you, we ought to rejoice at some of the prayers God hadn't answered. Oh, yeah. Woo, Lord, I'm glad you may let me dodge that bullet. <laughs> yeah. You see, God is free to pardon and he's free to punish. God's mercy is not rooted in man's merit. You know, I, I just think right now, uh, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Amen? It's by his mercy, not because you deserved it, not because you're good enough, clean enough, squeaky clean, wish behind your ears to get that old sin out of there. You know? That, that's not why it is. Uh Mm-hmm. Well, listen, punishment is according to man's stubborn wickedness. God placed Pharaoh on the highest throne of the earth at the time. And he said, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart, 
He hardened his own heart before God hardened it. I'm telling you, he hardened his own heart before God hardened it. Listen, don't you get a stiff neck and rebel against God and push up against God and, you know, give the fist to God or whatever other gesture you're thinking. And just don't listen. That will only go so far. And I don't know. I don't know where God's deadline is for you. But don't you be a fool and step over it. Stop making the same poor choices and wicked mistakes. Stop it. Pharaoh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I mean, all the plagues came and finally he said, all right, I'm going to let him go. And what did that knothead say? Tomorrow. Man, I'd let him go right now. Dear friends, I want you to understand that God's mercy is not rooted in man's merit. In, in verses 17 and 18, the scripture says, for the scripture says to the, to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up, that I may show my power in you. To this hard, hardened, reprobate infidel, Pharaoh, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. Do you understand? Do you understand? God, God, God's God, and he doesn't answer to you and me. We answer to him. Bless his holy name. Well, I'll say, well, hang on. Verses 19 through 23 talks, tells us about the potter and the vessel. He says, you'll say to me, why does he still find fault uh, for who has resisted his will? You know what the answer is? All of us. But indeed, old man, who are you to reply against God? Not me. Will the thing formed say to him who formed it? In other words, will the creation talk to the creator? In rebellion, only a fool will. Only someone who is limited in understanding would do such a, 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 a terrible thing. And he says, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? For the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another to dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? You see, that tells me that God, you, you know when God brought the children of Israel, when they finally, after their 40-year recess in the wilderness, you know, they sent the 12 spies in and Joshua and Joshua and Caleb said, let's take it. We can do it, boy. The Lord was with us. And, and the other ten says, oh, my goodness. We're like grasshoppers. They were comparing themselves to the enemy instead of comparing their God to the enemy. And so they had a 40-year wandering around till all that generation died out. Everybody over the age of 20, they're going to die except Joshua and Caleb. And he's, uh, this new generation grows up into adulthood, and now it's time. You know why he took them in and said, I want you to destroy them. I want you to kill every one of them. You know why? Because for generations upon generations, God dealt with those tribes. And they would not come to the true and living God, and they continued to sacrifice their newborn babies in the fire to a false god just like America has been doing since 1973 and I'm telling you just because just because righteousness prevailed in this election it's not over it's not over there's still a holocaust going on there's still the attack on traditional marriage you know if if someone wants to be a pervert you know, at their house, you know, that's between them and God. But don't you dare call it marriage because God defined marriage. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. It was Adam and Eve. And I've never put two roosters together and never got one egg. Have you? 
Have you? Not, not the first time. Two buck sheep together. You ever get a lamb out of that? Not the first time. Even, even, even nature, it's, that is against nature. Even nature condemns it. That, that filth, that sexual deviancy, those predators are one generation from extinction if we don't give it legitimacy. Don't give it legitimacy. Oh, well, go ahead and adopt. See where those two married men in Connecticut adopt a bunch of little boys and found out that they were abusing them and making porn, pornography from it. I'm telling you, sexual deviancy, the root of sexual deviancy is in hell. It's not from heaven. God loves every homosexual. He loves every pedophile, every, 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 form, every person in sexual depravity. God loves them and will save and deliver. But you've got to come to him on his terms. Can somebody say amen? Okay. Having fun, I am. So God raised up Pharaoh, put him on the, on the throne. He, 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 uh, uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then God made it harder. And then God he gives us the illustration of the potter and the vessel. Vessels were destroyed because they were not realized for their purpose. I'm telling you, God's got a perfect purpose. And let's let God have his way in our life. Amen? We're part of the bride of Christ. Saved, born again people, blood washed, followers of Jesus, Christians, saints of God. That's who we are. And we have a purpose for Walk in that purpose and let God use you. God does not create people in order simply to destroy them. He creates them for a purpose. The Bible warns against people being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You can look it up on your own. It's in Hebrews 3.15. I, I didn't give her that. But God's steadfast concern, verses 23 through 26 says... And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Remember, groups, groups, I'm part of the body of Christ. He's prepared me for glory. I can't do what you're supposed to do. You can't do what I'm supposed to do. Do you understand? I remember when I was a kid, and I, I thought, boy, I want to I wanna, I wanna preach like Billy Sunday. I want to preach like, uh, uh, you know, John R. Rice. I want to preach like, uh, uh, you know, and there was big, big name preachers, you know. I want to preach like Adrian Rogers. I want to preach like uh, uh, Lee Robertson. I want to I, I preach like, uh, um, you know, this one, that one, this one, that one. I realized I couldn't preach like anybody but me. Why do I want to preach like anybody? If God wanted me to be Charles Spurgeon, he'd have made me like Sp Charles Spurgeon. Do you hear me? But I, a Charles Spurgeon, I am not. That man's brain had to been twice as big as my little pen. Do you understand? Uh, D.L. Moody, I am not. An R.A. Torrey, I am not. I'm just an R.K. Vineyard. That's all I am. That's all I can ever hope to be. But in Christ, I can make a difference. Because it's he in me, not, it's his power working in me and through me. It's his power working in you and through you. Oh, boy, i got to hurry. The highest privilege on earth is to be a son or a daughter of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have yet everlasting, eternal, never-ending life. <laughs> A little amplified there. It's all good. Are you predestined to hell? No. My goodness, no. He wants, he is called, he, he's not willing that any should perish but all come to repentance. If you're here this morning and you haven't Turn from sin 
and put your faith and reliance upon him and his perfect work, I invite you to come today. And if, that, if you have truly been saved, but you just kind of floating around, you know, you're just kind of like you're, you're, you're in the boat, but your rudder's broke. Just whichever way the tide goes, the Lord can fix your rudder. He can sow you. He can, he, can, he can mend your sail. And when the Holy Spirit blows, you can go where he wants you to go and do what he wants you to do. Is that you today? Are you adrift? Well, then get in with both feet. Don't believe the devil's lie. Well, I messed up so many times. You couldn't have messed up more times than me. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. Most of our failures are right here in the mind. Don't believe the lie of the devil. Believe the truth of God Almighty.